All right, here we go. Cool, it's on the cloud. Um, okay, so maybe a little disclaimer for today's talk. It's gonna be several levels of quality beneath the talks you guys have been giving. Um, this will be sort of a practical talk. I'm gonna define some things, give very little motivation, absolutely no proofs. Um, and we're gonna try to tackle, I think I have six or seven qual problems relating to the topics. Um, so we'll talk about the ring structure on cohomology, and then we'll talk about Poincaré duality. Uh, and we'll do some fun problems, and some of the results are pretty cool, actually. So uh, yeah, so I apologize ahead of time. You know, you guys deserve better, but you know, either due to laziness or something. I'll also try to keep it shorter because um, I know you guys have other stuff going on. Okay, so maybe we'll start off with the cup product stuff. Um, okay, so the idea of a cup product is a product on these cochain groups. So remember, if we have these cochain groups, uh, uh, on X, and I'm gonna suppress the the ring. So you know this would be like X with respect to the coefficient ring R. We're gonna ignore this for now. Doesn't really matter. Uh, we have a product map from a a guy in the kth component and the lth component to k plus l. And maybe the way to see this or like why this should be doable, um, obviously we've, uh, last quarter in 225a, we've actually seen this with the wedge product, right? Like you have differential forms, you can combine them into a bigger differential form. So it's, it, it should be believable, but in terms of a pure like cohomology standpoint, Maybe the way to see this is using singular homology. So remember in the singular case, what did we have? These consisted like the elements consisted of, so, you know, given an element sigma in uh, C K plus L, this was a map from, uh, or maybe I should say simplicial. Let's look at simplicial. Uh, this was a map from our K plus L simplex. So it's a map from the K plus L simplex into X, right? With some properties. And remember the K plus L simplex just consisted of these vertices. Okay, so hopefully this sounds familiar. And the idea is I want an element of this guy from the elements of these guys. So an element of the K plus L uh, cochain is what? It's a map taking in sigma, right? And spitting out some number or some element of our ring. So let's think about this. Given two things, Let's say we have phi, which is in CK, and we have psi, uh, which is in CL. There's sort of an obvious thing we can do, which is we can define this cup product. Well, we have to say how it acts on sigma, right? Because this should be a map on sigma. And what we can do is we can take the first guy who lives in CK. So this should take in a map from the K simplex. So you can just have sigma and restrict it to the, the K simplex that comes first. So this is V0 to VK. And then you can multiply this by psi, which just takes the last L simplex. So this is VK to VK plus L. Okay, and this is believable. Um, now the question is like, you know, does this have the properties we want and so on and so on. Um, and it turns out this will. So essentially this is all that's going on. You're restricting to like some, you know, smaller face and some smaller face where each of them can act as they do. And then overall you get an element in the ring. Okay. And in terms of the properties, you just have to think of the wedge product. 
because it'll the wedge product is a cup product for Duran cohomology. So that's sort of our 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 motto here. We're going to think wedge product. So what is the derivative of the wedge of two things? Well, just like before, this is some sort of Leibniz rule, right? So we're going to take the derivative of the first cup the second, and then we have some negative one to the k, right? Because you have to somehow commute this through, similar in the Duran case. Um, and we have the other term. Okay, so uh, this has the property we want specifically. Um, I mean, you can check, you know, both of the, these guys all sit in uh, K plus L plus one. And moreover, this passes to homology. Or I should say cohomology. Um, so it's going to send uh, cycles to cycles. Okay, so what we're going to end up getting is we're going to get a map HK plus HL to HK plus L. Okay, and this is our cup, our cup product. And you know, some maybe listing some other properties, we have that the induced maps is just the cup product of the uh, the pullbacks on each element. So all of this is familiar from last quarter. Um, moreover, we have that this is satisfies some sort of graded symmetric thing. So if you swap them, you're going to multiply by negative one to the product of their degrees. Okay, so using this product, we actually have that uh, the cohomology space is actually a ring. So in homology, we actually only had groups. But here, since we have this product, we get a ring. So that's why it's often called the cohomology ring. Um, and one, one thing you can think about is like, think about like the exterior algebra, right? Um, so we saw this last quarter in the sense where, you know, you could big, you could multiply forms together. Um, okay. So the next big thing is the Kunith formula. Maybe actually, uh, are there any questions so far? I know I didn't really say anything. Um, I just sort of said that whatever we did last quarter with differential forms uh, holds for uh, just the cohomologies we've been talking about here in algebraic topology. Okay, cool. Um, and if you can think of more properties that help for differential forms, it's more than likely that they'd hold here. Like there's nothing really that special about forms. Okay, right. uh, Kunith formula. So the Kunith formula is we want to sort of combine the cohomologies for two spaces and compare this to the cohomology for uh, the product of the spaces. So what we have here is that, and you can maybe take this as a theorem, Uh, that the cohomology ring for X tensor with the cohomology ring for Y is isomorphic to the cohomology ring for X cross Y. Uh, and, you know, these are under certain conditions. So this is an isomorphism for, so we always have a map from here to here. But it's not always an isomorphism. It's an isomorphism if X and Y are CW complexes. Uh, and uh, the cohomology groups for Y, so like at each grading, is finitely generated free R module. And here we're using R coefficients. 
Um, okay, so maybe one thing I'll mention is that we can actually sort of relax this later. So Hatcher, you know, states it now, but later on Hatcher talks about this like CW approximation theorem. Um, so for any spaces you deal with, you can sort of ignore this statement, like this will be fine. Um, and this one is maybe a little more interesting, right? So like, first of all, notice like this is somehow not symmetric. Like specifically it's talking about the one for Y. Um, I don't know, that's a bit weird to me. Uh, I didn't look into it much deeper than that. But, but I think this will also generally be satisfied. Um, so for, for easy spaces, for example, like, you know, if you want S2 cross S2, these clearly satisfy, um, so maybe I'll say example. Uh, we have S2 tensor S2 is isomorphic to the space S2 cross S2. Right, because this is clearly satisfied. Um, these guys will be finally generated free R modules specifically. You know, there, there are, um, or maybe if we're dealing over Z, I guess we should probably include the rings here. Z, although it shouldn't really matter. Um, uh, yeah, so this is clearly finally generated free R module. Um, there's CW complexes they're nice enough spaces. Um, so this is sort of saying that if you, any, any element in these higher homolo uh, cohomologies can be run as, you know, cup products here. Uh, okay, so let's look at another example, which is actually more useful um, and comes up pretty often, which is the ring structure on RPN. So we're going to look at uh, H upper star of RPM. And we're going to do this for C2 coefficients. And the reason for this is that if you recall, we have that HK of RPM with C2 coefficients is just C2 for, you know, K less than or equal to n. Remember in our z coefficients, we had these alternating maps of zero and two. So we had, you know, we had a degree zero, we had z, and then we had um, alternating z, z mod twos and zeros. But when we pass to z2 coefficients, it actually looks very nice. Okay, so at each level, we sort of have one generator. So what would be a good guess for what this cohomology ring should look like. Like a polynomial ring over, over Z2, but like mod, it's like X to the N or something. Yeah, exactly. And specifically like N plus one, right? Because remember that you know we have we have a generator up until n, and then the next one's zero, so that's why we want to mod out by n plus one. And then if you look at this, and you know I can also write the grading of alpha is one, and so given the the cohomology ring, you can get each cohomology group right. If you just if you just restrict to one of the gradings, you'll see that a basis for this is like one alpha alpha squared all the way to alpha to the n. Um, so the nice part here is that uh, they play really well, right? So like, for example, you know, if you take a generator of, um, or even if you just take the generator for like RP1, which sits inside of this, which is alpha, you know, and you cut product it a bunch of times, you'll get the generator for the whole thing. So maybe something to note is that the rings for all the previous ones uh, fit really nicely inside any bigger ones. And this, this should be somewhat believable 
Um, so if M is less than that. This should be somewhat believable because you know the the RPMs actually sit really nicely inside the RPMs, right? Like they're somehow like you know like sub complexes or sub spaces. Um, so this shouldn't be too surprising. Uh, and you could keep this going, like you can imagine taking RP infinity, right? Take some sort of limit, and you'll get exactly what you think, which is just the polynomial ring um, with one variable. Okay, let's do another example. Uh, what about the uh, cohomology ring of CPM? And now we could use Z coefficients. Um, so can anyone remind us what the cohomology groups of CPN are? Or maybe the just the uh, CW, uh, the cell structure? This one was one in every even dimension, right? Zero, two, four. Basically the yeah. same reason there are PNs in every dimension. Exactly, yeah. And this makes the, the cohomology groups nicer, right? Because there's no like interference, right? If they're spaced two apart, then it's just a free module with however many generators. Um, so do we have any guesses for what this range should look like? Well, it's probably something really weird, isn't it? Because if you take the product of two things in any even dimensional space, you have to get back to an even dimensional space. It's like we can just completely forget about everything in odd dimension, right? Right, I mean, we know, we know, right? We know that the cohomology groups in odd dimensions are zero, right? Yeah, so I'm saying like, we can basically forget about those because we'll never have a product into them either. Mm -hmm. So does it just boil down to the same case as RPN then? It, yeah, it, it, it looks very similar, right? So we take the polynomial ring in alpha, or if you prefer alpha squared, but one way to write this is the polynomial ring of alpha mod alpha to the n plus one, where the grading of alpha is now two, right? Or if you prefer, you can do like the polynomial ring in alpha squared, right? So you only get even dimensions, but either way, this is the same thing. Okay, um, so I mean, this is for the same reason, like these CPNs will fit nicely um, and, and these are nice rings. Now you can try doing this for other rings. Uh, generally, it's not that hard to see what the cup product should be. Um, and maybe another question is like, what does the, the cohomology ring look like if we use Z coefficients for RPN? So now remember, whenever we have a generator, it's actually two torsion, right? Unless it's in, you know, like in the uh, k equals zero part. So it's actually two torsion. So you'll have something that looks like, you know, like maybe z alpha, where you know two alpha is zero, and and other terms, right? Um, so you might have something like probably the relations are just. Uh, it's modding out by the ideal of two alpha and alpha to the n plus one. And maybe this works. So it's, a, it's sort of a similar thing. When you say um, the grading is one or two, you just mean that the generator would lie in the second cohomology or the first. Yeah, group. exactly. Like, yeah, yeah. The grading just means that, right, when I'm giving you this ring, I'm telling you it's isomorphic to this ring. But from the ring, you have to be able to recover the full structure. So you have to know where everything is graded so that you can recover the cohomology, like the kth cohomology group, right? So if I didn't tell you that the grading was two, you might think like, oh, okay, the first cohomology group will have dimension one, the second will have dimension one and so on. But if I tell you that the grading is two, that means you know that there are only elements in even gradings. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, another way of like, you know, you could have just done this with T squared, right? And then it's pretty clear and you say the grading of T is one. 
Uh, a question about yeah. this is how, how would you show like for both of these examples that like alpha times alpha is not zero, like, like that uh, doing the cup of those two co-chains is like not. Uh... Yeah, so, so this is the proof I wanted to avoid. Um, <laughs> It's, you can find it in, it's not that bad, but it's just, it's just a, a diagram. Um, I think it's using, I think it uses excision at some point. It's just, it's just like a, 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 a diagram of maps and you, you know, you get your usual argument where you show stuff is, or isomorphisms. I'm gonna reduce it to a simpler case. Um, but it's a, it's a good question, right? It's not entirely obvious why, why this should be true. Um, but a key part of this is that you actually do have an isomorphism, like the inclusion or, yeah, you have an isomorphism between like uh, the cohomology ring for like RPM and the up to the mth part of the cohomology ring of RPM. Um, which maybe is somewhat believable. So you can do this sort of indu inductively because like whatever product structure you had here, if you sort of restrict to the, um, what's it called? Like the, the M skeleton here, you should have the same relations, right? Like things shouldn't really disappear. Um, again, this is hand wavy, but, but this is maybe how you should think of it or why it's somewhat believable. Um, okay, so let's actually do some problems. So let's do some qual problems. So the first one I wanna do is somewhat recent. I don't even know if they've posted the 2021 qual exams. Um, I think they posted them just this week, I think. Oh, really? Okay, yeah, I looked, I think I maybe looked a little while ago and they hadn't posted it. Um, but spring 20, number six is show that any continuous map from S2 cross S2 to CP2 must have even degree. Um, maybe this is similar to a problem you did last quarter. Um, but do we have any ideas? First of all, like what, what, what is the degree that they're talking about? How do we define degree? So like what happens to the top cohomology or, or happens to the top homology? So uh, maybe what you're saying here is that, you know, you have a map F from X to Y, right? We have a map, the pullback from the top, let's say HN of Y to HN of X, right? And assuming that these are, you know, uh, oriented or whatever, as long as this top homology is just uh, R, right? Or whatever coefficient ring you're using, this will be a multiplication. So if we're doing this over Z, so let's say we're doing this over Z, uh, this map is multiplication. It's just a multiplication uh, by D, right? If these guys are just both Z's and D is the degree of the map F. Um, similarly, like remember when we were doing integrals, it was sort of this scaling factor of the volume, um, which is exact same thing. Okay. So uh, using this, do we have any ideas for what should we should do here?
So like look at the ring homomorphism on cohomology and just see what has to be. See yeah. What has to yeah, exactly. Right. So we have, we have some homomorphism from uh, H star of C P two to H star of S two cross S two. Um, which, by the way, we know both of them. Uh, and specifically, we care about the, the generator of the top degree, right? So maybe we can restrict to four. So we know that the top generator is CP2, let's call it alpha, right? Um, but we know the ring structure. Maybe we shouldn't call it alpha. So given the ring structure, what can we say about this top generator? So the top generator, or maybe I should just say generator of H4 CP2 can be written as what? So maybe I'll scroll up a bit. We have this nice description it's like t to the fourth or something or yeah if we're using grading twos right it's like alpha squared right um so this is like alpha wedge uh sorry alpha cup alpha um okay so that's good right where this is alpha is a generator for h2 and now what can we do? We care about the image of this, right? We wanna see like, you have a generator here, you all have a generator here, and we wanna see what multiple of the generator we get. So what can we do? So we care about the pullback, right? Of this generator. which is just gonna be equal to the cup product of the pullbacks. Right? So really, if we can understand what this guy is, then we can understand it in general. Now, what is the ring structure on S2 cross S2? Can we name some elements? Or maybe we can use one of the theorems we've talked about. So which theorem related a product space? This is Kunitz's theorem. So it's like a generator of H2S2 times a generator of H2S2. Exactly. Right, so the top generator will be actually the cup product of these generators. Um, and specifically the whole ring is, and I should say tensor. Um, so really we have one generator here, right? So HS2 is given by Z adjoined alpha, alpha squared, right? Where the grading of alpha is two. And then maybe I'll say alpha one Uh, do we believe this? I mean, this one you can just compare straight up, right? There is no cup product. You have one thing at degree zero and one thing at degree two. So it, it just has to be this, right? It's just given by, you know, one plus alpha or like some linear combination of one and alpha, uh, where alpha is degree two. So really we have one of these for each of these cases. So we can describe the cohomology ring for S2 times S2. Specifically, it's just, you know, what, what types of elements do we have in here? 
right? We have elements that look like something times one, right? Um, so you have things, maybe I'll say uh, it's generated by, hmm, how should we say this? The, the idea is like you have things that generate are generated by like one, you have things that are generated by uh, alpha one, you have things that are generated by alpha two, and you have things that are generated by alpha one cup alpha two, right? And that's all of it. And so really, what can we say about the pullback of alpha here where alpha was this degree two element in CP2? Which grading should this sit in? It's like two graded. Yeah, this should be in the second grading, right? Which means what can we, we can write this as a linear combination of these two guys, right? It's gotta be that because those are the only elements. So this is like A1 alpha one plus A2 alpha two, right? So this is in full generality has to be one of these two things. Does this make sense? Okay, cool. Um, and now it's really nice because we're actually just cupping this with itself. So we're taking A1 alpha one uh, plus A2 alpha two, cupping it with itself. And now what does this simplify to? Well, you'll get cross terms, right? You'll get these guys. But what's alpha one uh, cup alpha one? Zero. It's zero, right? Um, and what's alpha two cup alpha two? That's zero two. So we just get the cross terms, which will simplify to two A one A two alpha one cup alpha two um, because of this like you might ask like okay you'll have this term which is this um, and you'll have this term but the alpha twos are alpha one are switched remember these are grading two so they actually slide past each other does that make sense do you want me to write this out in detail Like all I'm saying is that alpha two cup alpha one is the same as alpha one cup alpha two. Yeah. Okay. And this is the generator. This is the top generator for S2 times S2. Uh, A1 and A2 are integers. So therefore this is even. So do you think we would have to say on the call that like the reason you can commute these is because they like have even the alpha one and alpha two have even degree or something? Yeah, you should you should say something like, you know. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, you, you should probably mention this just to, you know, make sure you get all the points. You also you can write this in words, right? Since alpha one and alpha two are both even degree. Um, well, even, even if you got a reverse, you end up with like F star of alpha times, alpha, F star of alpha is like zero, right? So technically you would still get even degree, right? Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, but here we actually see we can have other degrees. Um, but you bring up a good point, which may be sort of the next problem, um, or at least similar to it. Um, okay, so essentially what we've shown, right, is we've shown that uh, F has even degree. And it really depends on the map you choose, because the map you choose will determine where uh, the pullback of alpha is sent, right? Like what linear combination you get. And I, I do believe you have choices in this. Um, okay, are there any questions on this problem? Okay, so this is a common type of problem. Like we sort of have seen two, two methods for solving these problems, right? Where they're like, show that any continuous map from here to here has blah, 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 right? Like it could be like null homotopic, things like this. Like the first way we did it 
um, is we did it using the, you know, like fundamental group stuff, right? And maybe uh, universal covering spaces, which you can look back at those talks. We did a few problems like that. And this is our next method using the cup product structure. You actually get, you get a lot of information, which is curious because remember these cohomology groups or these cohomology rings just came from the homology groups. So like somehow we feel like we get more information with cohomology, even though it followed from something like, how are we getting more information? Um, it turns out that there is a, a co-product structure on homology, but co-products are not so nice. Um, so it's, it's maybe less useful. But like you do have this sort of information on homology, just not in, in the way that we're used to dealing with. Um, okay, let's do another problem. Spring 18, number eight. Uh, so here we're gonna determine all of the possible uh, degrees of maps going from S2 to S1 cross S1. Um, so what do you guys think we should do here? Same deal. Yeah, same deal, right? We're gonna have uh, the pullback is going from H2 S1 cross S1 to H2 of S2. Oh wait, so your note was saying now since the negative one is to the power one, it does have to be zero, right? Yeah, exactly, right? So essentially like you can look at the generator here, this is alpha cup beta, you pull it back. Well, it's, it's even, I mean, it's, you like even before that step, like you could come up with an example where that is your argument, but we already get stuck before that step, right? Because these guys have to be in H1 of S2, right? They're the pullbacks of one forms, or sorry, um, degree one elements. So they're already zero, right? Does this make sense? So this is purely from knowing like the generator for this top thing, right? We know that any generator for S1 cross S1 is really a generator for S1 cup, a generator for S1. Uh, we've seen this with differential forms, right? Like for the torus, I think we did this, a problem like this last quarter, where it's like show that you don't have like every map from S2 to the torus is degree zero. And we did a similar argument, right? Like we know that, um, it's generated by like, you know, D theta one wedge D theta two. And then we pulled it back and saw that those are zero. Um, and so the whole integral was zero. So the degree must be zero. So that's the only possible degree. Um, alternatively, you could pretend that you have some sort of generators here. And, you know, you could try to do this, this same argument. Um, but it's actually a nice argument, like you could cook up a problem where it, you do have to use the, the part where like the negative one comes into play. Um, for example, if they weren't even degrees. Uh, okay, are there any questions on this problem? So like, these are like problems, like this is a whole problem. This was not part of a problem. This is worth 10 points on the qual. Um, you know, these are like the easiest points and these show up. Uh, both of these problems have shown up, I think, maybe two times each. So if you just remember this method, um, when you're looking for problems that, that sort of sound like this, right? Like determine all of the possible maps, determine all the possible degrees, show that these things don't exist. Um, half the time, it'll be cut product structure. The other half of the time, you'll use like fundamental group stuff. Um, three points. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, alternatively, could you use like the lifting criterion here? Like S2 is simply connected, so lifts up here and then that's like null homotopic or something. 
Yes, and then you'd have to connect degree to that, right? Right. Um, like somehow like the degrees invariant to homotopy. Right. If you could do that, then you're fine. Yeah, then it's obviously, you know, if you have the zero map, then that's degree zero. Um, yeah, so a lot of these problems could probably be tackled both ways. Um, okay, and then maybe I'll mention also that uh, in this top problem, there's also a variant fall 15 number seven, which is that show that there exists no smooth degree one map from S2 across S2 to CP2. Um, and, but we've shown it's, that they all have to be even degrees, so obviously that falls. Uh, okay, so that's that's what I have for you for on the cup products. Um, are there any questions before we move on to Poincaré duality? So are we allowed for things like S1 or SN, RPN, are we allowed to just like assert like this is the cohomology ring? That's totally yes. fine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is common knowledge. Um, I don't believe they've ever asked us to prove it. Like if, if this the whole question was proving it is, then you know obviously you'd have to prove it. But I don't think I've seen that on a call. Um, it is it's not a long proof. You can look at it. Um, I just didn't think it was the best use of time. It's better to just know what they are. And also a lot of these things you can sort of think through. Like. You could think like, okay, what, what should these be like? What are the possible choices, right? For things like S2 cross S2, um, obviously Kuhn's formula helps, but also there aren't that many choices. Um, if you know what the cohomology groups are, you know, it's, you know, either the cup product is zero or it's not zero, right? Like if the cup product on smaller generators is zero, that gives you one thing. If it's not zero, then you'll get the other only case. Um, okay, and it probably is, um, okay, yeah, maybe that's all I want to say. Uh, all right, so let's talk about Poincaré duality. And specifically, we're going to be talking about manifolds now, so we are in the setting of manifolds for a good chunk of this. Um, so let's maybe start out with talking about this orientation double cover. Have you guys talked about this in class in 225B? Okay, that's good. Um, this is just saying that every manifold Um, has an orientable two sheeted covering space. Um, specific for the M tilde um, called the orientation double cover. So you guys have probably defined this in class and really like you do this cheeky thing, right? Where you you take, you know, uh, you take a point with an orientation and this is sort of defining this, this new manifold. Um, and maybe the theorem is, so this is one theorem, right? That you, this exists. And furthermore, we have M is orientable. If and only if, uh, the orientation double covering has two components. Or I should say two sheets, two copies of M which have like, you know, opposite orientations, right? Um, it says my internet connection is unstable. You guys able to hear me? You were like frozen for a second, but you're back now. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so you'll have two sheets if it's orientable and if not, it'll be connected. 
So if you're not orientable, um, the orientation double cover will be a connected orientable manifold. Um, okay, let's look at, and maybe I'll mention a corollary. I'm not gonna prove this or really talk about this. Uh, it might not be that useful, but it is, it is sort of a nice fact. Uh, if M is a closed connected N manifold, so I'll just denote the N up top, is closed and connected, then the torsion subgroup um, of H N minus one so the, the one below the top one is trivial if M is orientable and Z mod two, if not. Um, okay, so I mean, it's just, it's just a nice result um, and this could come in handy, right? So if you have an oriented manifold, uh, it turns out the the homology right before the top one will actually be free, right? The torsion subgroup will be trivial. And if you're not oriented, you'll have a Z2. Um, and maybe one way to think about this is if, if you've thought about like handle body decompositions, is that somehow like your next to last handle body is controlling your orientation. Um, if you were trying to make it not orientable, you'd put in like a Mobius band, right? You do like a half twist and this will end up giving you this C mod too. Um, but if you wanna be oriented, then you won't have any twists. Um, of course, this is very hand wavy, but you know, this is maybe not such an important result, but it, it might be useful in some problems. Uh, I don't know if I've ever used it, um, but okay. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the cap product. So not the cup product, the cap product. Um, and this is a pairing between homology groups and cohomology groups. Or maybe I'll start on the chains. Um, CK minus L. So how can we do this? Uh, so again, like, you know, K is maybe greater than L. Uh, so essentially we have this guy who acts on like what you can think of as maps on L, uh, L simplices, right? If we're thinking simplicially. And we have here something that acts on uh, K simplices. So maybe the natural thing to do is to define this cap as you take phi, and you act on sigma restricted to the L simplex. So the first L vertices or L plus one. Uh, and then what are you gonna do with the rest of the vertices? Well, they actually land you perfectly in CK minus L because you can take sigma and restrict to the last K minus L. Um, so you have VL to VK. So this will be an element of the ring, and this is an element in here. So overall, you're gonna get an element in here. Um, okay, so, you know, again, this is a similar sort of definition we gave for the cup product. It's sort of the only thing you can do that makes sense, aside from choosing like which face to take. Uh, and let's look at some properties. So if we look at the boundary of this, right, because this is a, a, uh, an element of this chain group, we can look at the boundary of the cap product. And we have this mysterious negative one to the L. We're gonna get a boundary of sigma cap uh, phi minus sigma cap the uh, delta phi. And you can check these live in the right space. Uh, so the boundary, this should live in one lower. This lives in one uh, lower. 
which means when you take this, you're going to get something one lower. And this one lifts in one higher, so it's going to eat up an extra vertex. So overall, you'll have something one lower. Uh, and then this is somewhat curious, but maybe it's not the point. OK, so this is a boundary. And, uh, and so this will actually pass to homology. So this is the big theorem now, um, Poincaré duality. So this is Poincaré duality. And there are many versions. I'll give one here, and maybe I'll mention some other ones. Uh, if M is a closed uh, R-orientable N-manifold, uh, and when, when we're talking about this, we mean without boundary. So when we're talking about these closed manifolds, we mean not a manifold with boundary. Um, with fundamental class, which I guess I should define for you, uh, fundamental class M in this top homology. So really a fundamental class is like, if you're orientable, the top homology uh, will just be R, whatever your coefficient may. Um, and so this is a choice of generator. A fundamental class is a choice of generator. Uh, you can think of it like in the case where it's like Z, you have two choices for generators, right? You have one or negative one. Each of these corresponds to an orientation. Um, so, so this is just a choice of generator. Um, then what we have is we can define a map. You can also think of this as like a special class in the top chain. Um, so you can define a map going from H upper K M coefficients sorry, in R, uh, where this is just any ring, to H lower N minus K. So it's sort of complementary dimensions. And it turns out that the theorem says that this is an isomorphism. So what should this map be given by? Well, if we're trying to go from K to N minus K, this seems like a cap product, right? If you cap it with something in the top guy, which is exactly our fundamental class. So this is like D alpha should be the fundamental class cap alpha, right? So overall, this is N, this is K. So the thing you get out of here is N minus K. Um, okay, so this is the big theorem. This is relating cohomology groups and homology groups in a very nice way. Now, this is a very restricted setting, right? We're talking about uh, closed orientable manifolds. Um, again, closed means uh, closed means boundaryless um, and probably compact too, right? Yeah, closed is compact. Is that right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so we're talking about compact. Yeah, oh, this is definitely right. Because in the case where it's non-compact, we just have to take the compact least supported cohomology. So in the Durham case, you probably talked about this, the compactly supported Durham cohomology um, and the same theorem holds. So we're talking about specifically like, you know, compact orientable manifolds without boundary, but it's a really nice theorem uh, and I won't prove it. So maybe I'll mention also if it's not compact, uh, then the theorem will hold for compactly supported cohomology. Okay, and this is this is nice. So let's look at the first uh, maybe corollary, which is actually extremely useful in the qual. So this is extremely useful. On the call. 
Um, and the statement is a closed manifold of odd dimension has Euler characteristic zero. Crazy. Um, specifically, what does this mean in terms of uh, non-vanishing vector fields? There is one. Yeah, there is one, exactly. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, maybe you can think of this as like, there exists like diffeomorphisms without fixed points. Um, Cause you have a non-vanishing vector field. But either way, this is like, you know, it's, it's surprising how nice it is. So let's try to prove this. And maybe we can work together in this case. Uh, let's first do the case where M is orientable. So notice I, I didn't even assume orientable. Just closed. Um, so suppose M is orientable. How might we prove this? Do we have any ideas? We had that one characterization of the Euler characteristic that's like this alternating sum of degrees of your cohomologies. But in this case, you're going to have like everything minus itself. Um, yeah, that's right. Uh, so you have alternating sums of like the rank of you know, either homology or cohomology. It doesn't really matter, um, which is nice. And, you know, it's odd dimensional, so we're hoping stuff cancels. But how do we get there first? We're actually going to need an intermediate result, which has to do with the universal coefficient theorem. So we have these terms. I mean, maybe we can try like, you know, it's a corollary, right? It's a corollary to Poincare duality. Let's try applying Poincare duality. What does Poincare duality tell you? So you just replace all the k's and the hk's with hn minus k. Yeah, so like uh or but co you know co yeah, yeah, yeah. So rank or I'll say uh H K of M and I'll drop the, the coefficients. It's it's Z. Um, this is isomorphic to H N minus K for cohomology, right? This is what Poincare duality tells you. Now I claim that H n minus K, or at least the rank, is the same as the rank of the homology group with the same grading, right? So somehow, if this claim is true, we've gone from here to here back to here. So essentially we have a pairing between K and N minus K, and then we might have hopes that everything cancels out. How might we prove this? What, what theorem do we know that relates cohomology and homology of the same grading? Universal coefficient theorem, like you're saying? Mm -hmm. And uh, can you remind me what, what it says? Maybe Sam can, right? Sam uh, told us about it last week. As it depends which direction you want to go, it's the X plus the dual of the homology to get the cohomology group. X to one grading lower, anyway. Plus the um, dual of uh, the homology group. The and dual of the homology group? To get the cohomology. So like this? I believe so. That sounds right. Uh, sorry, did I? Ooh. Okay, uh, okay, cool. 
so something like this, right? Mm -hmm. And what goes in this X? One grading lower of homology and then also Z again, if I remember. Mm -hmm. um, so one grading lower of homology. Z. I'm gonna pull up the textbook to check. I think I think this is right. Um, and really, we only care about the ranks. So really, first of all, um, you know, manifolds will be finitely generated homology groups. So this is important. And for a finitely generated homology group, what can we say about the rank of this guy? Like the torsions don't really map into Z, right? They map into zero. So really, whatever the rank of this guy is, so the rank of HOM of the homology into Z is the same as the rank of the homology, right? Because you're only looking at the free part. And for each free part, you'll get one dimension. Are we okay with this? So maybe this is the first fact. Um, so really all we have to do is show that this X term has rank zero. So we want to show that the rank of this X term is zero. Now, again, we're gonna use the fact that these are finitely generated modules over Z. Specifically, we can always decompose this into a sum of a free guy and a sum of a torsion guy, right? Like I'm saying H n minus K minus one decomposes into some free guy, right? Plus some torsion guy. Um, and this probably relies on it being finitely generated. Or maybe it doesn't. Um, and we know X actually respects direct sum. So the X term is going to be this X term of Z to the R to Z, direct sum X term of this torsion guy into Z. Now, what is the X of Z to the R into Z? Just zero. When the first thing is free, it's just zero. Exactly, so this is a key thing to notice. Um, since this is free, it's zero. These are like sort of the only tools with X that we can actually compute. And when it's torsion, what do you end up getting? Something with zero rank. Yeah, exactly. You get something with torsion, right? So specifically zero rank. Um, if you remember like the X of like a Z mod PZ into Z um, was Z mod PZ, right? Is that true, Sam? Something like that, yeah. Something like this. I don't but remember the way, torsion property so well. Yeah, either way, it's torsion. So overall, the rank of this X term is zero. And so we have that uh, the rank of H n minus K is the same as the rank of H uh, n minus K up top. Um, which is amazing because Poincaré duality lets us convert between the two, but we have to change grading. UCT lets us convert between the two um, with the same grading, but then we have more difficult terms. But when we're only caring about the rank, those mo more difficult terms actually don't matter. So we were able to use both things. So what we have is that, uh, we can view the Euler characteristic on one hand as negative one to the K rank HK. And on the other hand, it's also equal to negative one to the K rank 
H n minus K, right, by using Poincaré duality, then UCT. And now you can change your variables, right? If n is odd, then negative uh, one to the k and negative one uh, uh, what do I want to say? Uh, maybe I mean, maybe I want to say something like this n minus k have opposite signs, right? Um, you know, odd minus even is, like if, if K is even, um, then the, this thing will be odd, this will be even, and if K is odd, this will be even, this will be odd. So they have opposite signs. So you can imagine just taking both of these series, change your variables, like let i equal n minus k. And so what we get is the Euler characteristic is also equal to uh, negative one to the, uh, what is this? So, if, so k is going to be equal to n minus i rank h i of m. And it's also equal to negative one to the k rank h k of m, where I can use the same variable twice, that's fine. I, add them together, we get two times the Euler characteristic is just one. Everything cancels out perfectly, zero, right? And then maybe another way to think about this is, you know, each term, we saw pairs up with the term n minus k from it, and they'll have opposite signs. So if you have an odd number of terms, or really if you, if you have n is odd, you'll have an even number of terms and they'll pair off perfectly. So we get that the Euler characteristic is zero. Um, and this is, this is, I mean, I think it's an incredible result. Um, and this will be very useful in problems. Now we've only done the case where m is orientable. What happens if M is not orientable? Um, and uh, Hagen, if you're just joining us, uh, the result we're showing here is that uh, every, every closed manifold of odd dimension has Euler characteristic zero. Okay, um, yeah. So this will be useful. And, and the idea of the proof was we use Poincare duality uh, along with universal coefficient theorem. And so Poincare duality will help you convert from K to N minus K and universal coefficient theorem gives you the conversion back. So you can sort of pair H K with H N minus K and they'll cancel out with opposite signs when N is odd. Okay. Um, so this is a nice result. We did the case for M is orientable because we needed that for uh, Poincare duality. Now, what happens if M is not orientable? What can we do? Are there any ideas? There are sort of two approaches. Um, the first approach is the one Hatcher takes, which is, I don't really like it as much, but what you can do is work over Z2 coefficients. Uh, everything is orientable over Z2 coefficients. So, but then what you have to show is that you need to show that uh, you can take the Euler characteristic over C2 coefficients, right? We don't know if this works for every rank. So you have to show that uh, negative one to the K rank of H, K, M with Z2 coefficients is your Euler characteristic, is in fact equal to your Euler characteristic, which was defined with like Z coefficients. 
Now it turns out to be true, um, but maybe this is not obvious. So you'll have to use some universal coefficient theorem to go from one to the other. Um, so that's one option. There's actually a, a neat little trick which uses a separate fact, but that is more believable um, and easier to state on the qual. So what else can we do? How can we bring this back into the orientable case? So here we worked over Z2 coefficients because it's Z2 orientable. What's a different way? Yeah. So if you pass to the double cover you're talking about before? Exactly. So we're gonna use uh, the oriented or orientable double cover. Right, so we talked about how every manifold has an orientable double, double cover or, or an orientation double cover, uh, and it's a two-sheeted covering. So what do we know about the Euler characteristic of a two-sheeted covering in, rela in relation to the orientation of... This is true for general covering spaces. If you have an N-sheeted covering space, uh, the Euler characteristic gets multiplied by N. So this is two times chi um, You know, this is uh, true in general for covering spaces. And by that, I mean like you replace two with the number of sheets. Um, I don't know if that's obvious or I should write that. Uh, so once you have this, it's actually like cheating, right? So I guess all of the work is really hidden behind this result, which on the quality you can just state, this is fine. Um, plus it's like somewhat believable, right? Like if you think about this in terms of, why is this believable? Um, I think uh, Professor Peterson said something about using Poincaré Hopf to do this. Like you, you have a vector field, and then you like maybe you lift it up here, and then argue something about the adding up the the indices of the zeros or something. Yeah. Okay. So if if you're translating this to Poincaré Hopf, this is very believable, right? Because you'll have a bunch of pre-images, so you can actually just add them up or you know, like multiply, right? Um, the issue with that is that this hides behind why Poincaré hop has to do with the Euler characteristic we defined, right? Um, which is a whole other thing, which is, you know, also, also maybe not obvious. Um, you know, there, there's a whole idea behind that. But either way, this is true. So yeah, on the qual, if you're asked to justify this or, or you should justify a lot of your statements, you can justify this using Poincaré hop, right? Like essentially, whenever we clean out one area, we just stuff it in another area. Right, like something's always being swept under a rug. It's just you gotta you gotta carefully um, move between rugs so they don't notice. Um, that's sort of the goal on the call. Um, okay, so then it's really easy, right? This reduces to the previous case, so chi of n is zero. Okay, beautiful. Um, this is good. So we've just shown that the Euler characteristic is zero. Uh, Let's use this and apply this to some qual problems. Um, uh, let's, yeah, okay. Are there any questions on this? So I know I haven't really talked about why Poincaré duality is true. Uh, maybe you guys proved this in class for 225B. Uh, if not, you can read about Hatcher's proof. It's different than the one you'll see in like uh, differential geometry. Oh, and maybe I'll also mention there is, there's a relative Poincaré duality, uh, duality um, that you can read about. I'm not going to talk about it now. There's also other types of dualities which come as a corollary, like Alexander duality, um, which might be useful, but they're they're not used as often on the qual. So maybe it's not worth getting into. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's let's look at some problems. Um, and these problems often show up, these, these actually show up every once in a while. Uh, on the qual I took in 2019, there was a problem. 
similar to one we'll do in a little bit later. Um, okay, so let's look at first spring 16 problem four. Um, let M with its boundary be a compact odd dimensional uh, manifold. Show that its Euler characteristic is one half that of its boundary, which is crazy again, like what? Like just, just being, I mean, I guess being compact is, is a big condition, but just being odd dimensional is, is like sort of telling you like, you know, a lot of information about the manifold can be just learned from its boundary. Um, okay, so any ideas here? What should we do? I think Olha and I actually did this problem but I don't know if other people have ideas I wanted to share first. Yeah, maybe if someone else has an idea, um, they can share, and if not, then uh, you can walk us through it. So, so again, like right, the, the the buzzword here: compact odd dimensional manifold. So, and Euler characteristic. So, we're probably going to want to somehow use this. Now, the fact is, the the maybe the obstruction in this problem is that it has boundary, right? We've been dealing with boundaryless manifolds. So, does anyone have an idea for how we can get rid of this boundary? Maybe we'll take a few seconds to think. And if not, then Jacob can help us out. Can we do something extremely funky where we take two copies of M and glue them together at the boundary? That's exactly right. Wow. It turns out it's not that funky. I mean, it's funky to visualize, but in terms of an operation, it's not that funky to do because, well, they have the same boundary. So take two copies glued at the boundary. Um, so, you know, maybe I'll denote this by M union M along the boundary. Um, all right, let's call this manifold N. What can we say about N now? It's got Euler characteristic zero. <laughs> right, it's still odd dimensional, right? The dimension doesn't change. You just don't have boundary now. So you're still compact. You're boundaryless. Euler characteristic of n is zero. That's good. But how do we relate the Euler characteristic of a union to the Euler characteristic of the individual things? What do we think? Maybe Meyer meters. Yeah, exactly. Um, so if we're using Meyer torus. Then, then what do we have here? How do we do this? How do, how do the arrows go? I mean, it doesn't really matter. Um, the idea is, is what? You have your you have these guys, right? And then you have an intersection. Um, I never remember which way it goes. Is the intersection pointing into them? Like this? Uh, yes, right? It's an inclusion for homology. Is this right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that, that is. Okay, cool. Yeah, for homology, reverse way. And then, you know, you get this long exact sequence. Now, we only care about Euler characteristic, which is a alternating sum, right? So if you have a long exact sequence coming from things like this, 
And the claim is that uh, the sum of the outer two, sorry, of A, where A is the whole chain complex, is the order characteristic of B. Uh, why can we justify this? Or why is this maybe obviously true? So I was wondering if, if this works in this case is if you have an exact sequence and you take the alternating sums of things, then you get zero. Um, and so if you just like apply that here, yeah. then since the ranks of like a direct sum add and stuff, then it should. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Um, when you have an exact sequence, right? This is like sort of the dimension arguments we use, right? So if we're only caring about the ranks, they all have to somehow cancel out. Um, and the idea here is that uh, these A's and C's will line up in the odd spots and the B's will always be in the even spots, right? When we connect this into a long exact sequence. Um, so that alternating sum will, will do the right thing. Um, is this what I want to say? But the thing is in this Euler curve, you have an alternating sum within this. So you might have to do some weird alternations, like, like you know, like negative one to the i, negative one to the i plus one, i plus two. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, cause you'll have to do bi and then minus bi plus one and so on. Uh, maybe the cheat is that like minus. Oh, oh, these, oh, these go to AIs, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's fine. Yeah. yeah. The, the key is that these goes to the AIs and then the BIs will have opposite sign from the previous BIs. Yeah. They're, they're three apart. Okay. Perfect. Um, okay. So this is, I mean, you can also just check this by doing the, you know, just pick a sequence and look at it. Uh, so using this, it's actually just follows immediately, right? We know that, so we have uh, the Euler characteristic of the boundary plus the Euler characteristic of this glued thing is twice the Euler characteristic of M. This guy is zero. So the Euler characteristic of M is half of that of the boundary. Um, so specifically, we know that the thing of the boundary must be even. Right, because Euler curvature is a is an integer. Uh, so that's something that also surprising. Um, the any boundary must have even Euler characteristic. Weird. Of a compact odd dimensional manifold. I guess that part is important. Um, okay, are there any questions on this problem? Are we good with this? So this will also be useful for other problems. Uh, so specifically one that I really like, going a little further back, is fall 12 number eight. Show that there is no uh, compact three-dimensional manifold such that uh, the boundary of M is RP3. So this is sort of saying RP3 is not fillable. Um, okay, sorry, RP2, not RP3. Obviously there's no three dimensional manifold with boundary RP3. The dimensions don't work out. Um, so how can we use what we just did? Well, I mean, I don't know what the Euler curve of the projective space is, but I mean, if it turns out to be odd, um, then we would be done by the previous bit. Yeah, what's what's the homology? Can we, um, let's remember the homology for RP2. RP2 uh, with Z coefficients. So the first one is Z. Um, what about the next one? C 
CMOD2. Yeah, it's CMOD2. And you can remember like RP1 fits nicely in, um, but you'll have this higher relation. Um, and H2 is zero. RP, uh, RP to the even powers are not orientable. So specifically, if we're looking at ranks, this is the only one that contributes. So the Euler characteristic um, is just one, not even. So we lose, um, which is a cool result, right? Like try proving this by hand. How do you show that like there doesn't exist a manifold? Um, which sort of fills this. Now, I'm a little salty because one of my research projects was, was doing some higher sense of fillability of, of RPNs in general, uh, and the project died, unfortunately. Um, but there actually is a really nice result, um, which is in Milner's characteristic classes. Uh, this is due to Pontryagin. Um, which actually says that RP 2N is not the boundary of any manifold. Um, now, uh, why is this different? in this argument. Um, is it any different? Maybe, maybe it's not the boundary of any manifold, uh, compact or not compact, right? So in our case, we just did it for compact things. This is for any manifold. Um, and they do this with, something called Stiefel-Whitney numbers, which are just maybe a little more informative. But the amazing thing is he has this theorem that says that any manifold like let's, uh, is fillable if and only if its Stiefel-Whitney numbers are zero. So he actually has the converse. Somehow, if you're looking at these invariants, which just give you numbers, and if you satisfy that they're all zero, you have to be the boundary of some manifold, um, which, is, which is a crazy idea that you can prove this sort of statement. So for example, all of the odd dimensional RPNs are actually boundaries of manifolds, um, which is pretty nice. Uh, but anyway. Maybe that's unrelated, but but we we've just applied maybe a different call problem to this call problem. Let's apply it to one more. Uh, let's look at spring nineteen problem ten, uh, which is the following. Suppose you have an n manifold, which is compact, uh, connected orientable uh, with boundary. And the boundary is a rational homology sphere. Um, so what does it mean to be a rational homology sphere? Uh, this just means that uh, the homologies of the boundary with Q coefficients, so this is the rational part, is the same as that of a sphere. Right, so it might not be a sphere, but it has the same homology of the sphere with rational coefficients. Okay, and part A is assuming N is odd, uh, use Poincare duality with Q coefficients which by the way, it works, Poincare duality works with any coefficients. Um, to show that the other characteristic is one. Uh, 
Um, you know, and if you're wondering, like, well, what's an example of a manifold we know whose boundary is a sphere? A ball. Yeah, a ball. And the Euler character is indeed one, right? It's contractible. It's all concentrated in degree zero. Um, but this is saying this for other things too. So how can we, sh and maybe I'll write B also. Uh, B is if N is equivalent to two mod four, show that the Euler characteristic is odd. Okay. Uh, let's solve A. So part B actually you need, I think Poincaré, uh, you need relative Poincaré duality. Um, but I think, you know, seven of the 10 points were given for part A or something. So part B is, is a little trickier, especially because it's not always covered in the course, um, but it's just a slightly different statement of Poincaré duality. And you'll need this because, well, you'll see that being even sort of screws things up a little bit. Uh, but how do we do part A? Anybody have an idea? Sorry. What can we do? I mean, we could just apply the same thing we did, right? Like if we're applying that other result, it's just one half of the boundary. This guy's two, right? Um, because you're going to have an uh, in even dimensional sphere. So the, the ones will add up instead of cancel. Um, so, you know, if we've already done the previous qual problem, it's super easy. On the qual, you can't just state that. You can't, you can't state this result. Um, so you would do the whole thing again, right? You would say, uh, take this manifold, glue it to itself along the boundary. Look at Meyer via torus. Uh, the glued version is now a boundaryless odd dimensional manifold. It's Euler characteristic is zero. And then you get the relation between the two. Um, so you know you'll have a you'll have a good chunk of work, but it's it's easy and it's not, yeah it's not so bad. So but but if we've already done the previous problem like it's just immediate. Um, so these problems end up tend to be easier. All the ones that have these like later topics, right? Like we saw with the cup product problems, that they were actually quite easy. Like they fall out immediately. If you know what you're doing, your solution might be one or two lines. If you don't know what you're doing, your solution might be zero lines. Um, but it's hard to like, you know, show a lot of work and get the right answer because the answers are so, the solutions are so short. Um, are there any questions on this one or on, on the last, I guess, three that we've done? So above when you were saying like is, law like the boundary of any manifold how come you can't just like cross with a half open interval or something and have like then your man any manifold is the boundary of like itself cross that thing right or am i missing something um crossing with the half open interval that seems fishy is this a thing I mean, like, it won't be compact anymore, but. Yeah, it won't be compact. Yeah, maybe you need, maybe you need the compact part of it. I mean, really the, the beauty of Pontryagin's theorem was the converse, um, but he also had, he had both directions using these stiefel whitney numbers. But I guess you don't need the full strength of them to show this for RP 2N.
Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if, if, yeah, if you take a boundaryless manifold and cross it with the half interval, half, half open interval, then yeah, you'll get a new thing whose boundary is that manifold. That makes sense. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, yeah, and you won't be compact anymore, but that's fine. Uh, okay, so I have one more problem for you guys, um, which has a little bit to do with this stuff. It's less direct applications, um, but this one I think has shown up twice in the past. So let M be a compact orientable uh, manifold of dimension four and plus two. Show that the dimension of H two and plus one, or I, maybe I should say the rank, um, is even. Uh, and maybe you can actually use this result and apply it to the previous problem part B. Because somehow the what goes wrong in the argument when n is 2 mod 4 is you get Euler characteristic things that don't necessarily cancel out. But maybe this takes care of it, maybe it doesn't. Um, I'm pretty sure you have to use just relative Poincare to LN here. Um, okay, so uh, any ideas here? This is maybe something you guys are more likely to see in 225B. But is someone related to these things? I think this was a 225B discussion problem like really early on, I remember. On the first two weeks, so maybe maybe uh, maybe you guys have a different solution, but I'll I'll walk through mine, um, or at least help you guys along. So we can construct a map. I'll just tell you where the map goes, and maybe you can construct it. Um, and let's look in the Durham setting which we can then use Durham's theorem to relate it to just cohomology. Uh, a map from the 2n plus 1 cohomology group to HOM from the 2n plus 1 cohomology group to R. So given a form like this, or you know, for being super careful of class, where should this send this? Like, how should we define this map? Just like wedge and integrate. Yeah, so like omega wedge blank and integrate over our compact orientable manifold, right? Essentially, like you're trying to form this pairing. Uh, okay, this is good. Specifically, this is the isomorphism from Poincare duality. But what else can we say about this map? Is this map symmetric? It's like anti-symmetric, right? Yeah, this map is skew symmetric um, because of degrees, right? Because you would pick up a negative one to the two n plus one. So we have a skew symmetric map and it's also non-degenerate. I think this is the solution that uh, Jahan gave and uh, gave, but um, I might be wrong. Hey, this is the solution. Right. Yeah, this is the one I know of. Um, and it's non-degenerate, right? Because essentially you can always find something to pair it with to get the volume form. Uh, 
um, like you'll for any element you could find something to pair it with. Uh, if you guys have usually Co at the end of two twenty five B does some like uh, Hodge theory. I don't know if Peterson has done this or will do it, um, but this is sort of talking about these pairings, and this map is skew symmetric and non degenerate. So we can we can sort of view this as a matrix. And what can we say about the the rank of this if it's skew symmetric and non degenerate? By the way, this is called a symplectic, uh, a symplectic uh, pairing. So we have, right, we have A transpose is negative A. And it's non-degenerate, meaning the kernel is zero. What can we say about the dimension? It's got to be even. <laughs> it's got to be even, right? Just for determinant reasons, right? Determinant of A transpose on one hand should be determinant of A. Uh, on the other hand, this is determinant of negative A, which is negative one to the dimension times the determinant of A. So N is even. And so you get your result. So it's sort of like a cheeky, a cheeky proof where you have to come up with this pairing. Now this, I mean, this is not obvious, um, but now that you've seen it, hopefully this rings a bell. Like if you see four N plus two um, and you're asked to compute something about the middle guy, oftentimes you'll want to pair this. This is also true for cup product problems. If you're asked something about the middle homology or cohomology, that's often should like something should go off in your head thinking like, oh, I should take this cup with itself. Specifically, if there's only one generator. You can sort of see if the cup with itself, it's gonna be either zero or a generator for the top cohomology. Um, there aren't really other, too many other choices. I guess you could have some multiple of it. Um, but yeah, you get even, so pretty much any, you know, symplectic pairing is, is going to be even. Um, and this just completes the problem. Uh, all right, are there any questions? So where are we using that, like, uh, the dimension of M is like the special form for N plus two or whatever? Uh, uh, this pairing. Right. Uh, I guess what I'm asking is, what if it was like a two n, and you were trying to show that you need skew symmetric. Oh, yeah, gotcha. you wouldn't be skew symmetric, right? Right. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, you also wouldn't be like a. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Um, uh, okay, yeah, all right. So this, these are all the problems I had for you guys. Um, are there any questions? They were all very doable once, once you sort of know how to do them. So hopefully like, you know, if I had to guess maybe one problem combined from these two sections could appear on the claw. Um, but still that's, you know, that's free points, especially sometimes these are the easier ones. So like really on the claw, you wanna you focus on the easy points you can get and then sort of squeeze out the harder points. I had a question about our uh, 225 homework that's actually related to this, if that's okay, but. Sure. I don't know if I'll be able to help, but maybe someone will. So the, the problem was showing that Kunath's formula works not just for uh, normal cohomology, but like for compactly supported cohomology, at least in like the Dharam case. Um, 
And the like critical step or like the hardest part he said of proving it is, uh, is even just showing that it holds for like, if you cross with R, for example. So for example, like M cross R that the K compactly supported, or K plus first compactly supported cohomology of that is like R cross with the uh, K compactly supported cohomology of the original thing. Mm -hmm. And I have a point career duality argument that seems to show that that's false, but I'm really confused. I mean, no, it's wrong. Something I'm doing is wrong, but I don't know what I'm doing is wrong. Um, yeah, what's your, what's your okay. argument? My argument is just like the turn it all into Poincaré duality stuff. Like, so what is it like uh, HK plus one compactly supported of R cross M mm -hmm. by Poincaré duality, that should be um, like uh, the palm of, uh, sorry, yeah, that should be palm of the normal cohomology, but like n minus k minus one or something, um, like the dual of that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then by normal Kunath's formula, we know that that is, or, or just by uh, like homotopy invariance, that should just be the same thing, but like get rid of the, the R there. And then use Kunath, use a Poincare duality again to go back. <laughs> huh. So something is wrong there because. Yes, yeah, so you're going to have hom of this tensor product, but the R part will go away. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm silly because R tensor anything is, and R tensor any vector space is just the vector space, right? Yeah, if you're tensoring over R. Okay. Sorry. Okay. That's, I think that's why I was. Did that about. help? Yeah, I think that I was just getting confused about that. Sorry. Okay, cool. Sometimes I accidentally help. Um, okay. Um, yeah, but but maybe I'll. Okay, I'm going to email about office hours this week. Um, and really, you know, it's like low key, you can swing by, do some proms for as long as you want and leave. Um, and I'll, you know, we could pull problems together and talk about them uh, and try to sort of give you as many resources before the call. And then hopefully those of you taking this call will be done with it. Um, those of you taking other calls will be done with the other calls and you guys can forget about it for the rest of your life, just like I did about non-commutative algebra. Um, or any algebra, really. Um, so that's that's sort of the goal of these calls, right? To be able to never think about this material again. Um, all right. Well, thanks for coming. Maybe I'll stop recording.